As you find your copy of the Word of God, uh, let's make our confession together at least in a moment of prayer of what we believe to be true about Scripture. This is not a book. This is not a history book. It is not a rule book. Uh, Scripture is the very living, breathing Word of God. And if we will submit to it, and if we will give our ears to it, God will speak to us in very powerful and real ways. So, where you're sitting in that pew, just put pause on everything else in life, and let's pray and say, God, I give you permission to speak. So, Father God, we come to this moment where we open Scripture. We have been singing our praise to you. We have been praying. We have been talking to you. We have been lifting up the beauty and greatness of who you are. We have been joining churches around the globe and the symphony in heaven, and we have been uh, lifting and exalting the glory of Christ. And now we, we still ourselves. We open Scripture, and we say to the living Word of God, Speak, your servant is listening. Father, we pray that you'll help us, you'll give us ears to hear, that you'll drive away the spiritual forces of darkness that we want to distract us and take us away, that we would not let any of your words fall, that you would glorify and honor yourself. Speak to us through Scripture today, and it's in Christ's name that we pray, amen. Ephesians 5, we're going to start reading in verse 25 here in a minute. We've been talking since Easter Sunday about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This gift, the very Spirit of God indwelling the believer, we spent weeks talking about how the Spirit works within the life of a believer, how it's through the Spirit that we fellowship with God, how through the Spirit we come to know His love, through the Spirit He guides us into all truth, the Spirit leads us and guides our steps, the Spirit strengthens our our inner being, the Spirit convicts us of sin and convicts us of righteousness. We've just... We've talked about different ways that the Spirit is at work inside of us about how we can expect to experience the fact that God indwells us. And so today on Father's Day, I want to use this opportunity to talk about another very real-life example about how the Spirit of God is at work in our life and why it is significant to try to walk in the Spirit as opposed to walking in the flesh. I want us to look at just a concrete example so that we don't walk away thinking this is kind of pie-in-the-sky kind of religious double-speak stuff that doesn't really affect real life, but to bring it down to real life. So you remember we did this on Mother's Day as well. We talked about what does the gift of the Spirit have to do with Mother's Day. And we talked about what we rejoice and celebrate about mothers is this unconditional, sacrificial, faithful love always on your side. And while we enjoy that, from our mothers, from the perspective of being a mom, looking at that calling, you could look at that and say, that's a little overwhelming. How can I love someone like that? And the good news about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit empowers mothers to love sacrificially, unconditionally, faithfully. And that's the good news. And so today we do that with Father's Day. and We talk about the perfect gift for Father's Day, which is the Holy Spirit. So if you'll read with me from Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read, starting verse 25, all the way through the fourth verse of the sixth chapter. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So in this paragraph, we get three specific job assignments for men. 
specifically for husbands and for fathers. Three job assignments. The scriptures are full of them, but just to focus on three today. The first one says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The second one is we are to bring up our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And the third one is that we are not to provoke our children to anger. So looking at each one of those individually, the first one, we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And Paul didn't just leave it at that and let us fill in the blank. He actually begins to paint a picture. And he paints this picture of what Christ did for the church. He gave himself up for her. So read Philippians 2, the passage that talks about how how Jesus laid aside all of his position and power and authority as the second person of the eternal triune God. He emptied himself of that. He became flesh, and then he died on the cross. So think of, of what it means for Christ to give himself up for the church. Verses 26 and 27 talk about what Christ has done for the church, sanctifying the church that we could be holy without blameless, uh, without blemish. Obviously, husbands, we can't do these things for our wives. We don't sanctify our wives. But he draws the parallel in verse 28. In the same way, we should give ourselves up and nourish and cherish our wives the way Christ does the church. So what does it mean, husbands, to love your wives the way Christ loved the church? You give yourself up for her to nourish and to cherish the very same way that Christ did for the church. Now, if you read that and you're not a little overwhelmed at that, then you need to read it again because you didn't get it the first time. I mean, the call that I am to love anybody the way Christ loved the church is just a tad overwhelming. Job assignment number one, guys, we are to love our wives the way Christ loved the church. Second job assignment, we are to bring our children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, your translation may say uh, training and instruction. If you've got King James, it says nurture and admonition. These two words, the first word that my translation translates as discipline is the word paideia. It simply means the overall bringing up of a child. The root, word is, is in, is the root word for a child. So it's the instruction of a child. It's the total upbringing of a child. The second word is a word that means to admonish, to warn, uh, to teach with instruction. So when I see the word discipline, I tend to think of when they do something bad, you know, you punish them, right? But the word that's translated discipline really is the word, the overall upbringing of a child. And the second word is sometimes that involves admonition and uh, correction. So the King James translation is actually pretty good. The nurture of a child and the admonition of a child, all of that under the umbrella of the Lord or in the Lord. We are to bring them up in the ways of the Lord. Or the message translation says we are to take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. Pretty good translation there. So If the first one wasn't overwhelming enough that we are to love our wives the way Christ loved the church, the second one ought to be equally overwhelming that it is our job assignment as a father to bring up our child, their overall instruction in the ways of the Lord. Everything from their mental development, spiritual development, physical development, emotional development, uh, you know, all of that in the ways of the Lord. Father, that's our job assignment. Again, if that doesn't overwhelm you a little bit, you need to go back and reread it because it ought to. And then to qualify it, this third thing is we are not to provoke our children to anger. If you got the NIV, it says don't exasperate your children. It literally means don't move them to anger. Parallel verse in Colossians chapter 3 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And that word translated discouraged means to basically to break their heart or to break their spirit. So we are to bring them up in the ways of the Lord without provoking them to anger, without breaking their spirit, without breaking their heart. So there you go. There's the job uh, description, job assignments for men. Love your wives the way Christ loved the church. Bring your children up in the ways of the Lord. And oh yeah, don't provoke them to anger, break their spirit, break their heart. Ready, go. Uh, And you should read that and you say, there is no way to do that. Now on Father's Day, this is exactly what we celebrate about fathers. I mean, I can personally stand before you and say, I've been fortunate enough, I have a father who really has embraced this job assignment. He loves his wife the way Christ loved the church. I have been watching him for 48 years give his life away to his wife, to my mother, uh, to seek to nourish and to cherish her, and so I've seen that lived out before me. I have a father who has who's made it a goal to bring me up in the ways of the Lord and has not provoked me to anger, has not broke my spirit or broke my heart. 
so I can celebrate my father who's lived into this. Many of you, I understand, look at this picture of a father and it brings more grief than it does celebration because the father you experienced did not live into this, did not embrace this as their job assignment. But this is what we celebrate on Father's Day. And to look at this from the perspective of being a father, you look at it and say, how in the world do you do this? So I look at this job assignment and I think, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to need some help. Uh, I'm going to need a great deal of wisdom and discernment. Because I, I cognitively understand, give your life away, but I may not necessarily understand it in the moment. Guys, right, we don't always get things in the moment. You can nod your head if that applies to you, right? Okay, wouldn't it be nice to have some help for in the moment for, for something to be able to say to you, okay, this is how you give your life away to your wife. Or this is how you teach your child. This is how you instruct your child. This is how you admonish your This is how you do it without provoking them to anger or breaking their spirit. It'd be nice to have some help, right? Uh, it'd be nice to have uh, s- someone basically whispering in your ear, do this, don't do that. Say this, don't say that, right? Uh, it'd be nice to have someone guiding my steps, kind of step by step. It would be nice to have some kind of superhuman strength inside of me that gives me the courage and the strength and the conviction that I need because sometimes this job assignment are hard. It's hard to look at a child that you love and who says, I want this, and to say, you may want this, but it's not the best for you, and so the loving thing for me to do is to say you no, tell you no, even though you're not going to like me, to have the strength and the courage to say that. Same thing is true as loving our wives as Christ of the church. Jesus was not a doormat for the church. He didn't give himself up for the church and then just let the church walk all over him, right? So that's not what it means. Sometimes it takes courage and strength to, to love in truth. And one thing I wish that I had as, as a husband who's trying to love my wife as Christ of the church, as a father who's trying to raise my children in the ways of the Lord, not provoke them to anything, one of the things I wish I had is that God could, that someone could take my, the little efforts that I give and make them into something big. You know, so if I, if I could do this little thing and it turns into a big thing, it's kind of like a farmer who puts a seed in the ground. They put a, a little bitty thing in the ground, and then suddenly it grows into this huge plant. You know, whatever it is that I can put my little thing in the ground and grows into something, that's what I would like to have. That, that God could take my little bitty efforts and do something great with. The good news about the gift of the Holy Spirit is every one of those things that I mentioned is part of the ordinary work of the Holy Spirit. We've been reading these things for the last two weeks. What does the Spirit do? The Spirit guides us into all truth. The Spirit convicts us of sin. Of sin. The Spirit leads our steps. The Spirit strengthens our inner being. The Spirit anoints our work so that what we do, He takes what we do and does something significantly different with it so what we did turns into something totally larger because of his work of of our efforts. The Holy Spirit does everything that we're talking about. This is what we need. That's the good news about the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we come to this job assignment as as men and as dads, and we basically have, there's three things you can do with this job assignment. Number one, you can look at it and you can say, well, there's no way I'm doing that. I will strive to be a good husband, and I will try to be a good husband father, but I'm going to define good husband, good father. This definition, no, 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 I don't want that. And quite frankly, this is what the vast majority of the people in our culture try to do. They want to be a good husband, they want to be a good father, which is why about half of the babies that are born in the hospital today are born to uh, single women, because somewhere there is a father who is, instead of saying, I will give my life away to nourish and to sanctify the mother of my children, instead of saying that, saying, well, I will try to be a good husband, but I want to define the terms of what that looks like. So most of our culture says, yeah, I want to be a good husband. Yes, I want to be a good father, but let me define what that means. 
Another way of looking at this, the second way is to say, yes, this is God's job assignment for me, and this is what I want to do, but I can do it in my own strength. I will do it for God. I'll go out there and I will accomplish this and I will do this on my own. And a third way to look at this is to say, this is God's job assignment for me. There's no way I can do it on my own. And so I am going to seek hard after the work of the Holy Spirit in my life so that God's Holy Spirit can empower me to carry out the job description that He's given to me. Now I assume the reason most of you are here is, is because you're not living in option one. You probably wouldn't be at church on Sunday morning, but I think there's a lot of us who are living in option two. I think this is what God wants me to do, and I'm going to try to do it in the best of my ability, as opposed to option three that says, this is what God wants me to do. There's no way I can do it on my own. I must seek after the work of the Spirit and His work through me so that He can do it through me. So I was thinking this week, why is it if we have been promised a gift that does such incredible things, in fact, does everything that we need in order to carry out this job assignment, why is it that we've been offered a gift that is so awesome, and yet many of us decide, no, I'll try to do it on my own, thank you very much. Why? Well, here's uh, some suggestions I have, or reasons I, sometimes I think that we just try to walk in the flesh. Number one, I think men are notorious because we have ictim syndrome. Ictim, I-C-D-I-M. I can do it myself, right? This is why men don't ask for directions. As the old joke says, why the children of Israel wandered around through the wilderness for 40 years because Moses refused to stop and ask for directions, right? Uh, we have this I can do it myself syndrome. It's why when we buy something that needs to be assembled, we don't read the instructions. That's why if you read the instructions, they look like they were written by a foreigner because they could not find any American male who would debase themselves to actually write the instructions. They had to go outside our country because we can do it ourselves. And this is part of the DNA. And yet the very essentials of the gospel message is you cannot do it yourself. You cannot reconcile yourself to God. You cannot do anything to have your sins forgiven. You cannot do any of this yourself, much less love your wives the way Christ loved the church, much less raise your children in the ways of the Lord, much less do it in a way that's not going to provoke them to anger. So guys, one of the things we have to struggle with is we have this victim syndrome, and we just have to confess that and turn away from that. And at the very beginning of seeking a spirit-filled life is the basic confession that says, I cannot do this myself. I need the very Spirit of God to indwell me and do this through. Another reason that I think men would prefer sometimes to seek uh, to, to fulfill our job assignment in the flesh as opposed to seek to be filled with the Spirit, I think we know intuitively that the Holy Spirit is like a lion that really cannot be controlled very well. Have you ever had, had, ever had this happen, guys? You've You've got something that's broken in your house. You've got a, a kitchen faucet that's leaking or something you can't figure it out. So you ask your father-in-law to come over and help. And your father-in-law comes over to help and starts walking through the house, pointing out everything else that's broken as well. Anybody had this, right? Do you know your fence needs to be repaired? Do you know you have a crack in that back window back there? Do you know your carpet's staying over here, so you probably have water damage? Do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know this? And it, you're like, hey, I didn't invite you over here to tour my house and tell me everything else is wrong. I invite you over here to to focus on the sink. And if you can't focus on the sink, then just go home, right? Uh, we know that the Holy Spirit, when we say, Spirit, I want you to come into my life and help me here, we know that the Holy Spirit's not going to stay here. The Holy Spirit's going to start roaming. And so we say, okay, part of my job description is to bring my children up in the ways of the Lord. Uh, the scripture tells us that we are to do everything as unto the Lord and not to, to other people. So I want to teach my son to have a good work ethic, to do everything to the Lord. And All right, God, come help me teach my son how to have a, a good work ethic. And the Spirit shows up and says, all right, good, let's talk about your anger. Like, no, 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 I didn't invite you in here to talk about my anger. I invited you to come in here and talk about how to teach my son to have a work ethic. 
Well, I, want, I want to teach my daughters about purity and how to be pure. And the Holy Spirit says, all right, great. Well, let's talk about your greed. And, hey, I didn't ask you to come here and talk about my greed. I asked you to come here and talk about this. See, the Holy Spirit's like that. This is the deal. We know, I think, intuitively, before the Holy Spirit wants to work through us, the Holy Spirit wants to go to work on us and within us. And I think, guys, we kind of intuitively know that. It's like, I'm not so sure I want to open that door, so I'll just do it myself. I don't want my father-in-law walking around here telling me everything else is wrong, so I'll just do the best I can on the kitchen sink. I don't want the Holy Spirit just roaming around here, convicting wherever he wants to convict. I, you know, I'll just do it myself. Before the Holy Spirit wants to work through us, the Holy Spirit wants to work on us. Another reason I think, guys, that we try to carry out our job assignment in the flesh, to be honest with you, many men are just spiritually lazy. We put a great deal of effort into our careers, and we put a great deal of effort into our hobbies, and we put a great deal of efforts in maintaining our homes, but we put remarkably small amounts of effort into our spiritual development. And then we wonder why it is that we don't experience God's mighty work through us in fulfilling his job descriptions that he's given to us. So let me give you a few action steps. Men like action steps. Now give me something I can do. Uh, and these are, by the way, these are in your uh, sermon notes that you can get through the church app or you can find these later on the church website. If you go under media, there's a tab there for sermon notes. You can find those there. Let me give you five action steps that you can take so that you can be a man who carries out your job assignment in the spirit and not in the flesh. This is not the sum total of everything you need to know, but these are five simple steps that you can take now as God can lead you to maturity in the future. The first one, go to worship every week. Every week. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir on some level for this. Uh, not, not when you feel like it. Not on the good days, but attend worship service every week. Make it a priority and something that you organize your life around. Don't send your wife and kids to, to church. Take them to church. Lead them to church. They follow you to church. Make it a priority in your life that says, I need to worship. I need to be in a place on a regular basis where I'm casting my affections towards God because I have to combat all of the worldliness during the week that tries to get me to focus on this world. I need to change that once a week and look Christ in the eyes. I need to be with a group of, of believers. I need to put myself in a position where God can speak to me, make worship a priority. Attend worship every week. Number two, join a small group Bible study. Now, by and large, I think men are a little hesitant to join small group Bible studies because we know if we commit to a group, we're going to have to commit to a group, right? Small group Bible studies are places where we get to know people and people get to know us, where we have opportunities to bear one another's burdens, and where we sit around with Scripture and we, we can ask questions, we hear other people talk about it, other people may actually realize that I don't know anything about the Bible, that my questions might be a little stupid, right? Uh, we are putting ourselves in that position, and so men like to avoid those kinds of situations. Scripture talks about how iron sharpens iron, and so you need to be in some kind of small group Bible study experience. In our church, we call them Sunday school classes on Sunday mornings. We have a Sunday school class for everybody from birth through age 150. If you live that long, we'll find a place for you. There's a small group for you. We have discipleship groups of three to five men who meet weekly for the purpose of becoming disciples. You need to be in a small group if you're going to live a spirit-filled life. Number three, read the Bible daily. Read the Bible daily. I'll say that one again. Read the Bible daily. I know that I start hearing, I start sounding, I'm sure, like a broken record because I say this all the time. The greatest thing you can do to develop your spiritual life and spiritual maturity is every day discipline a time that you set aside where you open God's Word and you say, I'm listening. 
And to do that, you need to have a plan to read Scripture. So in your sermon notes, there's a link there to a website that will help you choose a Bible reading plan. Uh, I should be able to stop every man as you're walking out of the doors of the church this morning, and I should be able to ask you, what's your Bible reading plan? And you should be able to tell me. Well, right now I'm reading through Matthew. I read a chapter a day. Well, I read daily bread, and whatever the scripture is for that day, I read that. Or I read open windows, or I, I have the Version Bible app, and I'm reading this Bible plan, and it emails me every day, this is what I read. You should have a plan. The, the man mantra, plan your work and work your plan, you need to have a plan uh, to read Scripture. It has never been easier to have a Bible reading plan. There's an app on your phone, the Bible app. You can choose a plan. It will text you, email you every day. This is what you're supposed to do. Okay? If you do not read Scripture every day, your spiritual life will be much more anemic than God intends for it to be. That's where God meets us and speaks to us. Fourth thing that you can do, action step, guys. Fourth action step is to meditate on Scripture. Now, don't get thrown off by the word meditate. I know we think of Eastern, that's not meditate. To meditate means to think deeply. Think deeply about what you read. If you don't find some kind of system to grab on to what God says to you every day, what you're going to do is read through one eye and it goes out the other eye, and ten minutes later you won't remember a single word of what you said. You need to have some kind of system that you grab with how God speaks to you. So in your sermon notes, there's a link to a very simple journal plan. It's called the SOAP uh, Bible Journal, S-O-A-P. Very simple. You don't need any fancy journey. You just need a blank sheet of paper and something to write with. So whatever, when you read your scripture that day, you're looking for S. What's the scripture that jumps off the page? You'll be reading through that, and one of them will go... Bloop. And you write that down, S. O, observations. What do you observe about that scripture? Is there a truth that is there? Is there a promise that is there? Is there a, a, a conviction about sin that is there? Maybe you have questions. You write down some observations about that scripture. A is application. Of all the Bible verses I could be reading, why is God having me read, read this one today? What does God want to say to me, not to the Christians in China, but what is God saying to me because I'm reading this verse? A, application. And then P, you pray about it. You just have a conversation with God with the scripture that you read. Uh, and that's it. It's a very simple journal method, but it will help you capture what it is that God's saying to you. Fifth action step that you can take is simple. Serve the Lord. Somewhere, somehow, serve. In other words, come to God and say, look, God, here's my abilities Here's my talents, here's my personalities, here's my education, here's my experience, uh, this is my schedule, this is all my responsibilities, I want to serve you, what would you have me to do that, that lines up with that? Uh, serving the Lord is different than volunteering. Volunteering is just helping, serving the Lord is helping with a purpose to serve the Lord. So we have men in our church, they serve the Lord by going on a regular basis to Presbyterian night shelter and serving meals. So they serve God by serving meals at the night shelter. We have men in our church, they serve the Lord. And every week they come up here and they spend hours mowing this campus. They serve the Lord by taking care of the church property. We have men that come to our WANA program on Wednesday night, and they are listeners. And so for the children who are, are working to memorize Scripture, they have to say their Scripture to someone uh, and so they get credit for that they know that scripture. And so we have men who are their listeners, and they listen to the children as they read their scripture. So they serve the Lord as they are listening to. Uh, we have men who serve the Lord by being Little League baseball coaches. They're not just coaching baseball, but they're serving the Lord by being in a place where I can teach baseball and I can salt and sprinkle all of this with the gospel message. And they understand what I'm doing is I'm serving the Lord by teaching baseball for Christ there in the community. The bottom line, though, is, is just like I should be able to stop you and say, hey, what's your Bible reading plan? I should be able to stop you and say, hey, how are you serving the Lord? How are you using your resources, talents, abilities, gifts, personality? What are you doing with that for the kingdom in a way that is unique for you? Serve the Lord. 
Now, those are just five action steps because I think guys like tangible things that we can do, right? Because you can look at this job description and we can say, no way, don't care, I'll just try to be a good husband and a good father, and I get to define good. Or you can look at this and you can say, okay, I can do that. Or you can look at this and say, okay, but there's no way I can do that. But I rejoice in the gift of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit at work through me will empower me to do this. And that's, I think, where Christ wants us to be. That's why I say today, the Holy Spirit is the perfect gift for Father's Day. Not that you can give your father the Holy Spirit, you understand. But as a father who wants to live into God-defined job description, the gift God would give to you is perfect to equip you to do your job assignment as a father. Let's pray together. Father, again, we continue to thank you as a congregation for this tremendous gift. I say it over and over, you could have simply died on the cross for our sins, you could have forgiven us of our sins, you could have gone up to heaven and you just could have sat there and waited. And you could give us these job assignments and say, go do it, in your own strength, in your own ability, just go do it. And it would be hopeless. Father, we thank you today that you have given a gift of the indwelling Spirit of God. And the very things that we cry out, in particular these job assignments, and say, boy, I need help with that. I need wisdom. I need direction. I need someone to guide my steps. I need someone to give me strength to make the hard choices. I need someone to take what I do and make it better. The very things we cry out are the very works of your Spirit as described in Scripture. How beautiful is that? So as fathers today, we embrace our job assignment. And we come to you and say, you're Lord of our life. This is what you've called, commanded us to do. We will set our face towards it. But we come to you and say, well, there's no way we can do this on our own. And so we set our face towards you to live as spirit-filled men and not just men trying to live godly lives, but to be empowered and filled by your spirit, your spirit at work, giving us wisdom, discernment, direction, guiding our steps, leading us, empowering us, anointing our actions. So, Father, we pray just very simply. Would you help us to find you? Give us the action steps, what we can do to seek you and submit to your work in our lives. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue our worship this morning.